Okay, so welcome, big welcome to each and every one of you. To start our proceedings, we're going to uh, stand, if you are able to, please. If you can't, don't stay seated. But um, we're going to start by singing a song. The song is actually in your program there, but it's going to appear, the words are going to appear on our the screen by my side as well. And it's uh, song number three. If you could join with me in singing, just to start, song number three. Thank you. 
Please be seated. So we're gathered here today. It's a solemn occasion. It's the funeral discourse of Christopher Nico. Who was Christopher Nico? Who really was he? Well, he definitely was a son. He was definitely was a brother. He was also a husband. And he'd been described as a friend. He also had children, so he was a father. Now, Chris was born in Uganda on the 4th of February, 1956. If you're trying to calculate how old he was, you know, as we do in our minds, in 2023, I'll, I'll help you out. He's 67 years old. He was 67 years old. He grew up in Uganda with his uh, two brothers. Both of his brothers are here with us today. And two sisters. Our deepest condolences to you for your loss. Now, Academically, he studied medicine. You have his study history in your programs in front of you. He was very, very well versed in study. In particular, he studied mental health. And he went on to be a psychiatrist. He came to the UK in 1982. And after a short period of study, he set up in practice. Chris had three wives. And one grandchild, who was a granddad. We're all grateful for family members. We want to just mention, we have many family members and friends here today. Sisitans to my left and in the middle. So we're all grateful for you being here. My sincere condolences to each and every one of you. Now, life is difficult in this system of things, in this world that we live in. And Chris, although he was well established for work, there was a period in his time where he felt there was something lacking. Because life throws these curveballs at you, doesn't it? And he felt there was something lacking. So what he did in 2008, he looked towards the spiritual aspect of his life. And this is when he started studying the Bible. He did this with Jehovah's Witnesses, starting in 2008. Now we said that he's a very studious individual, so he didn't take his studies very lightly. In fact, he studied the Bible for four long years before he decided that this was the religion he wanted to associate himself with. He studied for four long years. In 2012, he became a baptized Jehovah's Witness. And soon after, in 2013, he married his wife, Filda. Filda, our sincere condolences to you. Now, he loved his job. He loved his work. And what he loved about his work was meeting people, meeting individuals. Now just think about it, here's a man who was well versed in academia, very well qualified, extremely qualified. He could have made a lot of money. He could have gone into any kind of business, banking, but yet he chose a profession that dealt with helping people. That just shows the kind of character that Chris really was. His colleagues at work actually have written quite a few cards to Phil. And when you read through the cards, the sentiments, you really see the character of Chris when he was even at work. In fact, I've uh, transcribed two of the cards just to read out to you. So you can actually feel what I felt when I read the cards. And it's addressed to family and friends. This is one of the cards, it reads like this. It says, to Dr. Nico's family, 
I was so shocked and saddened by the sudden loss of Dr. Chris. I wanted to let you know just how much he was loved and respected by his team. I personally found him to be the most helpful, approachable and understanding doctor in this team and also who I have ever worked with. I did on a regular basis tell him that he was my favourite doctor. This I truly meant. My thoughts and prayers are with you all at this sad time. Love and best wishes. Doesn't that show the kind of character Chris was, even to his work colleagues? I've got another one, a short one here. Dear family, it is with much sadness I find myself writing this card to you. I worked closely with Chris for the whole time he was with us. He was so loved and respected amongst his colleagues. He always made us smile when we had we were having a bad day or a busy day. He always had a smile and a cheery face and would always help when he could. He will be hugely missed by all. We have very fond memories of Chris. He was a wonderful man, a doctor and colleague. This goes to the sentiment of the person, the individual. Even at work, people love now Chris liked the natural attributes of his cells are legible. He loved nature. He also loved taking long walks. Now I've been told It was a very good quote. Jeffrey says that Chris was the fabric which intertwined our family together. He was the peak of his happiness, he was very generous, and he gave of himself to everyone. That really shows the kind of character Chris was. Now, I knew Chris for a very uh, relatively short period of time, really, for about eight months when we joined the new congregation here in uh, Wanstead Park. But I had quite a few interactions with Chris as a, a fellow elder at elders' meetings, as well as where we sat. We sat just there on the right hand side in the middle. If he came early, he'd get our seats. So we'd have to sit behind him. So we'd try to get there early, and then he'd have to sit behind us. So we, we sat in the same area. So we had a few interactions. And my impression of Chris was that he was a very soft, calm, gentle, individual and especially in elders meetings what he brought to the what he brought to the table was a calming influence i know in uh, once at park congregation that's this congregation that we're in at the moment he'll be dearly missed and especially the body of elders he will dearly be missed now we're all at the moment because it's a sad occasion we're all uh, feeling sad it's natural. It's normal. Uh, if Chris was here because of his profession, he'd tell us that grieving is a normal process when you lose someone, especially a loved relative. 
So we need comfort at times of loss. And I've suffered myself, I'm sure you have. You must have lost someone close to you at one time or another. It's a, it's a heart-wrenching pain. It's not a kind of pain where you have a cut and you can put some ointment on, or a plaster. It's a deep-seated, wrenching cut of a pain that you feel helpless. There's nothing much you feel that you can actually do. Is there any hope? Well, we might be familiar with the uh, biblical character, Lazarus. Have you heard of that character, Lazarus? I think most of us have, haven't we, Lazarus? In fact, that word is synonymous with being brought back to life, isn't it? That word, Lazarus, being, being raised. Well, it would be interesting, and it's, it's a point to note, where Lazarus himself wasn't the actual focal character in that story. He wasn't actually the main character, although he was there. The main character was actually Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you have, if you have a Bible, if you haven't, and uh, you're next to someone who has, perhaps you could uh, share. And we are going to read uh, the book of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11, verses 33 through to 35. John 11, 33 to 35, it reads, When Jesus saw her, now this is her meaning, of the sister of Lazarus, Mary. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself. And he became troubled. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Now this is the point, verse 35. Jesus gave way to tears. Now, let's just ponder and pause there for a moment. Here's a man, the Son of God, with the power to resurrect Lazarus. In fact, Jesus knew that Lazarus had died three days before. And he specifically travelled there to meet the family and to resurrect his friend Lazarus. So he knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to resurrect Lazarus. But the scripture says, Jesus gave way to tears. Why cry? You're going to resurrect your friend. The simple answer is, Jesus showed sympathy to family and friends. See, he saw the atmosphere around him. He felt the atmosphere around him. People were crying, people were mourning. And he felt that grieving process. Now, the, uh, they said the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. His father, almighty God, he also has tender feelings. For us. Yes, he has tender feelings for us and he wants to even help. If you have your Bible open there, Psalms 34 and verse 18. Psalms 34 and verse 18 says, Jehovah is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Well, that's nice. But is there any practical help actually given? Well, if you drop your eyes down to Psalms 147, verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. That's nice. There's actually practical help even given then. But we have to ask the question, why do we have to go through this grieving process? Why do we have to even have pain and sorrow? Why? Why do people die? Well, we as Jehovah's Witnesses, and Chris would have been no different, have made a study of the Bible. And therein in the Bible lays the answer. Death is, well, the result of Adamic sin and disobedience. Because we're descendants of Adam, we've inherited that imperfection and that prospect of death. 
This is brought out in the scripture at Romans. Romans 5 and verse 12. You turn with me there. It reads, you have it? Yeah. That is why, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because they had all sinned. Now the Bible tells us clearly the condition of the dead. The soul is mortal. The Bible tells us that. So the dead are actually unconscious. Now that's a comforting, because we now know that Christ is in pain. But the big question is, and here's the big question, Chris is dead, but is there any hope? We've studied the Bible, we've come to know that God has many different qualities. Qualities like uh, wisdom, justice, power. But what typifies God is the quality of love. And because death wasn't God's original purpose, because he designed man to live forever, on a paradise earth. The Bible says so. Because death wasn't that original purpose, out of that love, he is given a hope. Now, we're going to read the scripture, Revelation 21 and verse 4. This hope is for dead loved ones, but also for us, if we think about it. In one way or another, we are suffering right now. Whether you have an ailment, whether you've lost someone in death, or maybe growing old, or perhaps just wearing one of these, you have to wear glasses. One way or another, we're imperfect. And this scripture gives a hope for the future. Jehovah's Witnesses know this scripture almost by heart. So in Revelation 21 and verse 4, God says, And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more. Neither will mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. See, that one hope in that scripture gives millions who have died, and all of us, the opportunity to live again. And the resurrection hope that we're talking about was only made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We've read in our, uh, there we go, we've read in this, the program, Chris's academic qualifications. He was very, very well qualified. But does his academic qualifications qualify him for a resurrection? Well, the answer is no. No. Not at all. So what qualifies you, him or us, to benefit from this scripture? What type of qualification is needed? What kind of standing is needed? Well, let's have a look at the scripture. The scripture is at Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1 reads, it says, A good name is better than good oil. Now this is a strange thing. It goes on to say, And the day of death is better than the day of birth. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Now can I be honest with you, as a young child, I'd heard this scripture and I was confused. I was absolutely confused. I didn't understand it because we were brought up to believe that when someone is born as a baby you know the whole family rejoices don't they they're happy it's a cute little baby but when someone dies you grieve you're saddened but the scriptures actually says the opposite doesn't it it says the day of death is better than the day of birth so as a child i was a bit confused because it doesn't make sense As I grew up, then slowly 
matured, I got to know and studied the Bible, I got to know the meaning of this scripture. The meaning is actually right at the beginning, where it says, a good name is better than good oil. Now this is not talking about our literal names. This is talking about reputation. A name. What kind of name have you made for yourself? What kind of reputation do you have? Now let's think about it. What kind of reputation would a baby have? A newborn baby. Cute, isn't it? Goo goo, gaga, <laughs> little noises. Has it got a reputation though? No. It hasn't had an opportunity to gain a reputation because it's a newborn baby. It hasn't had life experiences. But as that baby develops into childhood, as that baby becomes a young adult, proves themselves in life, the experiences with their family, with their friends, that adult now, if that adult did die, that adult has had an opportunity to have a reputation as a name for itself. So let's read that scripture one more time. This is the full sense of it. So Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, it reads, a good name is better than good oil, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. So when that child becomes an adult and then dies, it's almost as if that death day is better because it's had an opportunity to prove itself. That's what the scripture is aiming for. Have a great reputation or has made a name for itself. Chris made a name. See, Chris had a great reputation, not just in academia, not just at work, but he also made a name for himself in his community and especially with God. Now, how can we benefit from being here today? Well, a funeral reminds us of the brevity and uncertainty of life. The reality of death really does make us think normally, doesn't it? It makes us think about how we are using our life, what we've done with our life. Are we making a good name for ourselves with God? Chris made a good name with God. How did he do that? Well, he studied God's word, the Bible. That was number one. Four long years, we've said. He listened to God's commandments. He got baptized. He mixed with like-minded people. He spoke to God regularly in prayer. And he obeyed the Bible's command to go preaching. Chris made a good name with God. He had a good reputation. Now Jesus said for us to store up treasures with our heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with having material things here and there. Nothing wrong. But he said to store up treasures in heaven. See, by our zealous works and godly conduct, we share in doing just that. Those who do so, well, they will be certain to have that hope, just as Chris has. And hopefully, one day, he will have that possibility of seeing Chris again. Now, we should use this occasion, our spiritual brothers and sisters, uh, family members, friends, we should use this occasion to comfort one another. Also this occasion to get to know one another. Here, and perhaps even at the reception that we're going to after. Get to know one another. Sh interchange thoughts. Anything you knew about Chris. How he affected your life. And perhaps we could take that opportunity to comfort one another. To family members and friends, well, we could ask you to strongly take to heart what you've heard here today. It means life. It was very important to Chris. He studied long and hard. I mean, if something has stirred in your mind, if something has stirred in your heart, that perhaps you've heard here today, or perhaps a scripture 
that's been opened up for you. Well, take action. Ask one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Ask one of the friends of Chris's. We also have a website. I'm not trying to plug the website, but we also have a website, jw.org. Yeah, it's very simple. If you're not that one of those people that like to speak to people, go onto our website. There's loads of information there. Please, it was very important to Chris, we will ask you, because if he was here, he'd tell you exactly the same. We'd ask you to do the same. Whatever the case may be, we want to be in a position, I'm sure you'll agree, we want to be in a position where one day we'll be happy to see Chris again. My time's up. Thank you. So just to end, we're going to just say uh, a little sentence from the family. The family would like to thank you all for attending this funeral discourse today. It is a real comfort to know that we are surrounded by the love, prayers and thoughts of all who knew Chris. So I'd like to end by saying our deepest condolences. We have, uh, even on Zoom, we have over 71 people Zoomed in at the moment. So that's good, isn't it? Along with the people here, because we're packed here, we have over 71 Zooming in. So we can just see how he was loved and liked in the community. So we want to say our deepest condolences to you all, whether you're on Zoom, whether you're a family member, perhaps you're a friend <coughs> or a work colleague, or maybe just a friend. To end off, we just want to say our deepest condolences to you. We're going to now sing a song. So we're going to stand, if you're able to again, sing a song, and we're going to close with prayer. The song is 151, He Will Call.
Heavenly Father Jehovah, may we approach you now to thank you for allowing us all to gather here this afternoon. We know it's a solemn occasion and we are saddened because of our loss of our dear friend, brother, Chris Nico. We know that he is in your memory and we know with all his uh, achievements in life, especially towards the community and spiritual achievements he's made, that we will see him once again. But at this particular moment, sometimes that doesn't help our grieving process. So please, Jehovah, may we ask for your help and your guidance to be with us. Please help us in the weeks, months, and even years to come. Help the family members. Help his household, Filda and various other members, his brothers, sisters, his mum, children, grandchildren. Please help them all, Jehovah. May your blessing and your guidance be with each one of us as we continue to the reception now. Help us all to get on with one another and to have a spiritual interchange of encouragement with each other. We thank you for the awesome privilege that we have, the opportunity that we have, serve you in this life and please Jehovah help us to make good use of that opportunity we leave ourselves now thanking you once again and offering this prayer to you through the only name possible your heavenly son saint Jesus Amen, Amen. Now, if you could just remain standing as the bearers remove the coffin So we're going to just make our way to the uh, reception hall, which is the address is on the page two of the actual program, uh, the address and postcode, Alderbrook, Alderbrook Community Centre. But if we can ask family and friends to follow the coffin first, and then the rest of us will leave.
this um, very solid... ...for your blessing upon the evening, that things may go according to your... take place according to your will and according to your praise. So we wanted this very occasion. So we thank you for all the work, work that's gone into providing these things for us, and we pray a blessing upon the meal that we're about to partake. Get themselves served. Just a few announcements. So, if you want to use the toilets, it's right at the back. If you want to use the toilets, it's right at the back side and come through the front door here. Because there's no way for you to get your phone and come back the same way that you went to get your phone. So, please, we to make sure that we don't have any incidents at all. Okay, so. Can we ask the family please to, at the high table, if you're ready, please just get up and get your food served. Thank you.